بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم سو این 1974 سپتمبر I was studying in Stanford in the first year of the PhD program, just like you are today in the first year of your PhD program. My teacher was Duncan Foley, who was a very well-known, and at that time he had a um, Foley-Sidrowski model, was a very good macro model which was very popular. But at that time, he had started to have serious doubts about the macroeconomic theory that was dominant in all of the economic theory. So he was actually undergoing an internal change. So instead of teaching us from standard macroeconomic textbooks at the time, he said we should go through Keynes. So we did, we read Keynes and I did not understand a single word. So I just couldn't, you know, the book was completely beyond me because uh, it didn't deal with any of the uh, categories that I knew about. We had learned macro, but uh, Keynes did not talk about anything which deals with conventional macro. Oops, that was a mistake. So, um, Ultimately, because um, what he was saying and what the book was, nothing made any sense. So, I finally found a book. Um, it was somebody, uh, Leon Hoofwood is the name, yes, who had written a book explaining Keynes. I read that. That was fairly good. I could understand that. And uh, I managed to pass the exams and the comprehensive on the basis of what Lion Hoofwood had to say about Keynes, but I never understood what Keynes was and I never understood what my teacher was trying to teach me. Because he himself was not actually very clear, he was not, he was very confused, he was trying to. Uh, so now the thing is we are in a very similar position, but one of the things is that uh, the more you know conventional economics, the more difficulty you will have in understanding this course. It's not true that the, um, that the it's, it's those who have fresh minds will be able to understand what is going on uh, much more easily. Because they are, they are not, uh, I mean the, those who have learned conventional macro have triple job. First they have to um, understand what actually conventional macro is, which most people have not done because they have just memorized the formulas and learned how to do things. Then they have to unlearn this and understand why it is wrong and then they have to learn the new material. For those uh, who are fresh, they don't have to do the first two steps of unlearning so they can start right away. So that's one thing. The um, second thing is that um, we are starting from zero. I mean, there's because basically Keynes started with zero. And you know, Keynes said that everything that we have learned so far is wrong. Um, and actually, it's an obstacle to understanding the real world. So, actually, in the process, I am trying to, I could teach this much more simply in the sense that I could forget about conventional macro what they say and why it is wrong and just teach the what Keynes said directly and that would be much simpler but then you would not be able to understand what conventional macro is and you would not be able to talk to macroeconomists. So unfortunately I have to teach all three things, what the, what the macroeconomists say, why it is wrong and what is the truth. So it is a bit complicated but everybody is in the same boat. Uh, there is no need to get discouraged and the only way to learn is to ask questions and do exercises and struggle. And uh, at the time that you are struggling, it doesn't seem like as if you are learning anything because you are just too busy and you are getting a 
actually you are, what you are getting is a cluster of ideas which are interlinked they do not make sense any one of them on their own so you have to understand a lot of different things and once you understand all of them then they will uh, make sense but it takes a while for this to gel in the mind so just don't get discouraged that's all and keep working and you will understand what is going on much better than I was able to because I have a much better understanding now than I did 40 years ago. <laughs> so, all right. So, um, at this point, I mean, all of the preliminary work is more or less zero. We are starting from chapter one of general theory, and um, basically, Keynes is talking to his fellow economists, and he is saying that. Uh, the classical theory that you have learned is a special case. It doesn't work. And what is the special case? The classical theory works under the assumption that there is always full employment, but this does not hold. So if there is always full employment, then he says that the classical theory will work, but this is, since this is not true, there is no... Uh, when, when full employment does not hold, then um, classical theory does not work, so now we are going to <coughs> now we are going to learn what happens when there is unemployment. So in the classical theory, just like exactly like conventional micro theory and macro theory assume that there is always equilibrium, and in fact the world is always in disequilibrium. So, in order to understand the world, we have to understand disequilibrium. So, conventional economics does not understand anything of the world. It is a special case. Actually, I explained the <coughs> idea of equilibrium and disequilibrium in the last lecture. So, uh, if we want to understand the world, the real world, we have to just get rid of new classical ideas. There is no equilibrium and there is no optimization and we will see that today also. So basically conventional economic theory is based on the idea that everybody is always optimizing and that uh, what happens in the process is not relevant, what happens in the end where you get up and in equilibrium. So it's important to understand what is equilibrium and what is disequilibrium. Uh, equilibrium is a situation which has no tendency to change built into it. So if the uh, so if it's a situation which can keep on going, everybody is getting what they planned. As we will see uh, in this lecture, hopefully, uh, things can happen in which um, unexpected things happen. Now this is something which uh, unexpected things never happen in equilibrium because you make plans and those plans are fulfilled. If the plans are not fulfilled, then something has gone wrong and you will make some changes and that's exactly disequilibrium. And uh, you know the supply and demand story, the cobweb model, so if you plan to sell something and it didn't sell, or, then you will make some changes and ultimately you might converge to equilibrium or you might not but basically the issue is that you have to understand the disequilibrium processes. So basically Keynes is saying that the, in the full employment equilibrium, if there is an equilibrium at full employment, then the classical theory of economics works. When there is unemployment, the classical theory does not work. Now all of the historical background that uh, you have read, Ferguson and my posts, explain that history, the real world that we look at, does not display equilibrium. It is not that the employment level is flat and constant. It keeps going up and down for unknown reasons. So this is, this is the thing that Keynes was looking at. 
Now, one very important thing that I would like to start by, today we are going to look at a model, a very simple model. Now, the thing is that in um, the understanding of economists today, what is a model and what is reality and what is the relation between the two is not understood at all. This is a very serious problem because um, because of this completely completely ridiculous models are very commonly used. So for example basically Friedman said that the more ridiculous a model is, the better it is. And that's that's uh, that's just stupid. <coughs> but the point is that people did not say it's stupid. People say it's brilliant. And your textbooks in economics repeat this, that yes, a model does not have to be realistic. So if a model doesn't have to be realistic, then how can it be a good model? Well, if it produces forecasts which are uh, matched with the real world. Now, the, this is a, a, a just a major misunderstanding and I have explained it in detail in other lectures and I will provide some links to that because that's something you should read to understand why conventional economics is so bad because they do not understand the concept of model and reality and the relation between the two. <coughs> I will just go over it very briefly so that you have an idea. Well, basically, as I told you that in the West they had a deep psychological trauma because they rejected their religion, because their uh, religion was very difficult to follow and their priests and uh, popes were not following it because it asked for things to do which are humanly impossible. So, because, so this leads to you know a psychological shock that God is not there. The most uh, important thing that principle that we use to organize our life is not does not exist. So then they said that, all right, from now on we will never believe in anything which is unseen because that leads to shock. So because of this psychological trauma, they said from now on everything that we do will be based on what we can touch and see and feel because if we believe in unseen, it may not exist and may cause us damage. So now, <coughs> <coughs> there is the surface reality that we see. Behind that surface, there is a hidden reality, which generates the surface. We see the tree, behind that there are roots and cells and there is the sap which is running inside and there is the chlorophyll inside the plants which we cannot see, and huge amount of mechanism. But we say that no, all I can see is what, what is out there. What is behind may exist, may not exist. The thing is, and this is actually the philosopher Kant had a very important role in this. He said that yes, hidden reality exists, but we don't have any access to it. We only have access to observation. So it is stupid to think about things which you can never uh, which you can never um, know whether or not they are there so just forget about that just work with the observables yes reality hidden reality exists nobody can deny that but since we don't know anything about it so let's forget about it why talk about things about which you cannot know anything we can know what we observe we cannot know what we don't observe that's the logic that was given. So f now the understanding of the model which is correct, which is what I am trying to teach you, is that a model is 
something which is, describes this hidden reality to the extent that the model ma matches, matches what we cannot see, it will be a good model. Now what Kant said was explicitly threw away this idea, which was the idea of Western philosophy as well before Kant. Uh, that in when we try to make a model, we are trying to really find out what is the hidden reality. And to the extent that our models match the hidden reality, that is the extent to which they are good models. But Kant said that this is something that is impossible. You can never know if the model is a good match to the hidden reality because you can never know what the hidden reality is. So forget about this question. A model can be anything. As long as you the model matches the surface, the model produces something which matches what you can see, then it's a good model. Because the, the real requirement of a model that it matches the hidden reality uh, is impossible to verify. So, <clears throat> that is how the idea that you can make a model. So today, a model is an independent structure. It is a mental structure. We can make any kind of model we like. And uh, the only test of a model is that <clears throat> the predictions that it makes should match to the reality. <coughs> the model itself can be completely ridiculous. When I was in graduate school, one of my teachers was Robert Oman, and uh, one of them was Mordecai Kurtz, and they made a model <coughs> of taxation. And this model goes as follows, that um, we are playing an artificial game in a group. The majority coalition, people form coalitions, and when they form a group, then they can impose their rules as long as they are the majority on all others. So <clears throat> then uh, the standard outcome which they calculated was that okay, a, a majority will form, it will be exactly n plus one, uh, n over two plus one people, half plus one to get them a majority. And then they will imp uh, impose a tax which takes everything away from the other. The, the minority coalition, because that is the maximum revenue, they don't want any extra members, because the, the rules of the game are that the majority can get to do what it wants, and so they will take everything away. So this is too simple, there is nothing very <coughs> interesting about this model. <coughs> so they said, okay, uh, let's make uh, a little bit of change, because this does not explain what we see. If we l look at this prediction, then it says that so the minority coalition will have nothing and the majority coalition will have everything. So they said, okay, we give one more strategy to the minority coalition. That is that if they don't like the outcome that is being proposed, they can just burn their allocation instead of giving it away. So now when you do this, then there is a game theory that now the majority will not impose 100% tax. They will be forced to think about how much tax they can impose, which the will uh, the uh, other side will tolerate and will not burn their coalitions. So it gives a more reasonable picture of the tax. So they calculated the game theoretic equilibrium and then they said, okay, here is the taxation rule which emerges. Let's look at the real rule for uh, how uh, taxation and they said, okay, there is a rough match. So our model is reasonably good. Now. <coughs> This was, paper was published in Econometrica. Now, according to what I uh, am teaching you, this is completely ridiculous. This paper should be thrown in the garbage because there is no match between the assumptions of the model and reality. We know that reality does not work like that. If you want to make a model of taxation, you should go to the real world and you should look at the Congress and every year they are making tax laws and you should ask how do they make tax laws? And then you should try to understand that. <clears throat> but uh, according to the Western understanding of modeling, they don't have to do anything about finding out the mechanisms by which the world works. They can just imagine anything that they like, just like this game, and then just say, okay, here is my model. Whether it's realistic or whether it's not makes no difference. 
And now all I have to do is to check the predictions of the model with the uh, observed tax structure. Now this is a completely ridiculous approach to building models. <coughs> so that's why, because of this ridiculous ap approach, all of your compatriots, just like in 1977 there were many batches of people, so in 2018, September, all over the world there are people sitting in macroeconomics classes and learning macroeconomics and they are learning these completely ridiculous models which have nothing to do with reality. And then they are told that <coughs> these models will actually uh, produce results which actually match. People say, well, you know, this macro model, it doesn't have nothing to do with any uh, the, the categories we are using. And the theories, you know, I, I, I have this uh, quotations. Right, let's look for it here. Keynes, of course, was very frustrated with economists. He said that professional economists are unmoved by the lack of correspondence between the results of their theory and the facts of observation. Robert Solo says that uh, if somebody says that I am Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, then you should just laugh. You should not... Uh, enter into discussion with, well, what were your battle tactics in the Battle of Austerlitz? Because, uh, you know, you that's... And he says, basically, Lu Lucas and Sargent, they are madmen. That's what he's saying. Because they make crazy assumptions. And that's what they do. They make completely crazy... Steve Keen says that, how anybody can think they can analyze capital while leaving out banks, debt and money, is like an ornithologist who is trying to figure out how birds fly, but he doesn't have wings in his model. Ariel Rubinstein says that uh, after 40 years I have yet to find a single application of game theory in my life. Stiglitz says that Ricardian equivalence is taught in every graduate school in the country. It's also complete nonsense. Ah yes. Uh, Narayana Kocher Lakota is the head of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve and he says that basically if we use uh, models to um, make predictions uh, they are um, uh, then we are saying that this model is a it has some relation to reality. My view is that this basic premise of serious modeling is wrong we do not have a successful theory of macroeconomy. So, if the theory is completely wrong, then why use it? There is a paper I haven't cited here, Daniel Terullo, who was the governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and he said that at this time we do not have a working theory of inflation. That's the title of his. And uh, he, is, yani, he is in the position to know because, I mean, the job of the Federal Reserve is to control inflation. And if you don't have a theory of inflation, and you can find papers by the dozens, determinants of inflation, somebody says this, somebody says that, there is no clarity. The one principal theory that was believed in widely, the quantity theory that inflation is principally determined by money, has uh, proven to be empirically false since the 1980s. It's not that before the 1980s, it's a reasonably good fit. After 1980s, what happened in 1980s? Basically, financial deregulation took place. So, uh, um, in basically in Great Depression, there was a very strong uh, regulation of financial institutions, which prevented banks from going wild with money creation, and so the quantity of money creation was controlled. But basically, the relationship between money and inflation has broken down. Especially importantly, after the <coughs> after the uh, global financial crisis, the theory in the head of Ben Bernanke and the other people 
who were managing the crisis at that time was the monetarist theory and that was that the basically crisis and depression that's what Lucas thought come because of uh, insufficient money in the economy and so and, and the Great Depression could have been prevented if the uh, global uh, if, the, if the Federal Reserve had taken active steps so they took steps this was called quantitative easing it's a strategy that has never been tried before they made infinite amounts of money available to the banks and all of the economists were extremely surprised when they found out that inflation didn't happen inflation was at two percent I mean money supply was pumped up to the max but inflation did not take place contrary to the so basically nobody knows what causes inflation at, at that point actually people do know but the real theories are not uh, available in the macroeconomics textbook which continue to teach as if there is no problem quantity theory of money if you read take a standard maximum uh, conventional textbook it will say the same thing uh, Olivier Blanchard who was the chief economist at uh, IMF he said that DSGA models are based on assumptions profoundly at odds with what we know about consumers at firms. It's not just that they are wrong, it's not that they are simplifying assumptions, they are just yani, dramatically at odds with, they are in contradiction with what we know. So this again, how can we use a model which is in contradiction with what we know? Because of this idea that model doesn't have to match what we know. Greenspan said similar things and basically all of this is go, goes back to Friedman who said that the more ridiculous the assumptions, the more strange, the more weird, the better the theory. So, uh, so we come back to the general theory and basically what uh, Keynes is struggling with is the assumptions. Now at the time of Keynes this was not the ruling idea that um, models can be completely ridiculous. In fact economists believed in their models and they wanted their models to be true so and, and they had arguments and logic for their models unlike today where you don't have to give any argument for your model you just write down equations and then you see you can check to see if it matches if it doesn't match then you can say well this model doesn't work for this situation it doesn't mean that the model is bad or wrong it's just that you shouldn't use it in this situation you you try to find something in reality which matches if it matches oh my model is good for this if it doesn't match then okay we will wait maybe later on something will come along which the model matches so the model is good on and in and of itself it doesn't have to have any match to anything in any reality. But this was not the case at the time Keynes was working. So Keynes had to uh, had models which were given with arguments. So basically he starts by saying that the uh, labor market is wrong and he says that there are two theories. One is that the wage is equal to the marginal product of labor and the so this is the um, this is the theory of demand for labor and it is based on a very simple and very easy to understand idea but as we will show in the model even though it is very simple very easy to understand very plausible very believable it is wrong nonetheless because the world is more complex than appears to the eye because what is true at the level of the firm is not true at the level of the economy as a whole. So what is this very simple theory it's that okay I hire a labor he uh, produces some marginal value there is some some additional uh, production takes place because of my hiring of the labor and in our model that you are supposed to have studied before coming to this class um, 
every laborer produces 10 units of corn. So it's very clear the marginal product of every laborer high, I hire is 10 units of corn. So there is no question. Now, I have to pay something to this laborer. So if I am paying him less than the marginal product, I am making a profit. And now the second thing is that usually there is continuity. As we will see, this doesn't matter very much. So if I am getting 10 units of corn and I have to pay him 5 units of corn, then I am making a lot of profit. So if I hire the next laborer, maybe the marginal product goes down to 9 and maybe, uh, well actually according to the um, theory that we are following, every firm is very small So uh, the, in the perfect competition area. So marginal product will remain the same and the wage will also remain the same. So I will make more profits if I hire more labor. But let's suppose more realistically that as I hire more laborers, the marginal product goes down. The, if, if the wage market, if the labor market is very large and we are in a competitive world, then hiring an additional labor will not have any impact on the wage. So still I will have profits. And I will, so I will keep on hiring until the marginal product becomes exactly equal to the wage. In this process, suppose that we make an even more realistic assumption that as I hire more labor, the wage will increase. That can also happen because I am increasing the demand for labor. So even then, the wage will go up, the marginal product will come down as I keep on hiring and ultimately at the equality of marginal product of labor and wage, I will stop making additional profits and that's where I will stop hiring. And before that, I will keep on hiring except, you know, marginal units there. Okay. It may be a little bit off by one unit or two because if I hire the next one, I may go over. But basically, approximate equality of marginal product and wage is guaranteed by the profit maximization condition. That's one of the axioms. And Keynes accepts this axiom, although, as we will see in our model, this is not going to work out. Yes. 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 And then the real wages should go down. Why? We will go over the model in detail soon, inshallah. So, hold your questions. So now the that's one part. He accepts this one because it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the second uh, assumption is that there is a labor leisure trade-off and laborers work. Um, until, uh, so the laborers receive a real wage and this real wage that they receive, I mean they don't look at the nominal wage, they look at the real wage because that's what matters. I mean uh, you're giving money but is what can I buy with this money is what matters to me and so if I can buy what the goods I can buy are enough to compensate me for the discomfort of working then I will work. So that's, it also makes sense. Now what he says is that the observations that we see in the real world are not compatible with this, that the uh, labor works until the wage is equal to the marginal disutility, the real wage equals the marginal disutility. So he says on the basis of these two axioms, basically there is no possibility of unemployment. And that's what you have seen. No possibility of what is called involuntary unemployment. If a man is not working, it is because the going wage rate, which is determined by the marginal product of labor, is not sufficient to attract me to work. <coughs> so what the market is offering as wage, which is the marginal product of labor, I don't want to work 
uh, the discomfort from working that I will get is greater than what I will receive in wages. So he says that this is not true. Because, and this is not true not because of not because of theoretical reasons, which is the axiomatic approach. It is true because what I see in the world out there is not like that. So this is the great difference between a scientific approach to economics and an axiomatic, Greek axiomatic approach. The Greek axiomatic only works with the axiom. Tell me what is wrong with this axiom. The axiom makes perfect sense. And that is how after Keynes destroyed economics, they put it back together on exactly the axiomatic basis. That okay, here is my axiom. Tell me where it is wrong. Not, uh, not why we look at the world because we don't look at the world in the axiomatic approach. Now the approach to modeling that I am trying to teach you is that we develop our theories, uh, the theories in the model, the alternative which I am trying to explain is that we look at a very complicated reality. Many things are going on. A model is an attempt to understand this reality. <clears throat> so a model is a simplification which we can understand, in which we try to capture all of the important elements and eliminate everything that is unimportant. And this is the basis of simplicity. Again, many fundamental scientific principles were never understood by the West. The most, uh, because they got this from uh, Islamic civilization through Spain, and they never understood the uh, philosophy behind it. They, they understood how to do it, they understood how to drive the car, and they did it very well, but they never understood the philosophy of science. So the philosophy, of, uh, to, to this day, they don't understand philosophy of science. So <clears throat> one of the principles of philosophy of science, which was formulated by Ibn al Haysam or one of our, is that you should try to make models simple. <coughs> so this is called Occam's Razor in the West. But Occam's razor is that you should shave away um, complicated things and try to make models simple. But this is not understood why we should try to make simple models. Actually, the point of making simple models is not what Western philosophers think. Now, the point of making simple models is that you have very complicated phenomena. You want to understand what is the minimum possible setup which is needed to reproduce this phenomena. What are the things that are essential to understanding this phenomena? And what are the things which don't matter? Even if they didn't exist, the phenomena would still occur. So now the phenomena we are trying to understand is unemployment. Why does unemployment occur? So now we need to produce a model in which unemployment will happen. And we want to do it with this in the simplest possible case because that is what we can understand. The more simple the model is, the easier it is for to un us to understand. Now why unemployment occurs in the real world? That is very complicated because there are so many different factors. So now I want to build a simple model and that will help me understand how the reality. Now if I make a ridiculous model like a coalition forms, then it will not help me to understand what is going on in reality. So the the models we build should be matched to reality and should be extreme simplification. Now, you might say, and it is true, that the extreme simplification does not match reality. Uh, and that is true. We have deliberately simplified reality to get to the essential elements. Now, this concept was misunderstood by Friedman that yes, model doesn't have to be realistic. Yes, it's true. Model doesn't have to be realistic. A lot of things we will throw out of the model because the phenomena, because what we are trying to do is not build a model which matches observe. We are trying to explain, we are trying to understand something which happens and we are trying to understand. So to understand something we want to produce it with the simplest possible uh, elements that are required to produce that. All right. So. What uh, Keynes is doing is something scientific. He says that, okay, like, what we see in the world is not matched to what our um, axioms say. 
And he says, okay, what we observe is a lot of unemployment, a lot of fluctuation in employment. So he says that in our model, supposing that these two axioms are true, there are four ways in which unemployment can occur. One is frictional un unemployment. <coughs> uh, so people lose a job and then they are searching for a job. So it takes them time to find a job. So in that case, they will be unemployed. But uh, that's not uh, disequilibrium. That's just normal. Then there can be voluntary unemployment person he wants to work but he cannot find a job at the wage he is looking for because the market wage is lower okay so he's unemployed he's looking for a job but he wants a thousand rupees and the market is only offering 800 rupees so he's voluntarily unemployed in the so then he can be unemployed he can say I want a job but um, he is not unemployed according to the supply and demand theory and so this is the second type. <clears throat> the third reason why the unemployment can fluctuate is if there is fluctuations in the real wage. And this can happen. For example, suppose that the price of corn goes down. So then at the same nominal wage, uh, the real wage of the worker has increased. So he will want to work harder and more. So the employment will increase. So that's the second factor. And the fourth factor is a uh, change in the desire to work. So the utility, so if the uh, laborer becomes more, uh, less allergic to work, works harder, then he will be, the marginal disability changes. So these are the four factors that he says can lead to changes in, in employment. And then he looks at the real world data that he saw on unemployment which uh, <clears throat> was uh, there following the Great Depression. The unemployment was very high and he said that none of these factors make sense. I mean these factors cannot explain what I am seeing. Now this part you cannot put into the axioms. You have to have a pair of eyes. and. Uh, this part is not accepted by the economists who work in an axiomatic world. So, now this depends and basically it depends on observation. The economists say that, you know, it was due to unionization. The firms were asking higher wages. He said, no, you go and talk to the workers. They are willing to work for lower wage. So now this, because you are living in an axiomatic world, you don't need to check with the real data, you don't need to talk to the laborers, you don't need to ask the firms what they are doing, you just make up your theory and the theory is logical. So because of this um, failure of the, so there are these A, B, C, D, these are the four conditions which Keynes puts down to explain why unemployment can happen according to the classical theory. And says none of these four make sense. Yes. No, no. They are not the same thing. Uh, voluntary unemployment means you are not willing to work at the going wage rate. Uh, the uh, utility for labor does not change. But if your utility function for labor changes, then your desire to work will be yani ke, the, the disutility of labor yani, uh, will change. So that's a different factor, which is internal, yani personal factor. Ke, your comfort from discomfort from working changes. The uh, wage is an external factor in the real world. If the wage goes below, the real wage goes below the amount that you would like to get for your work, then you will reduce your hours of working. So one is an external factor and one is an internal factor. 
All right, so <coughs> <coughs> so he says that there are two observations which I will make, uh, which one of them is the attitude of the workers, and he says that when we look at the real world, we see this phenomenon. And there was a major coal strike, if you have read Ferguson. Uh, the government said that, okay, let's reduce the wages of the laborers. They had a huge budget deficit. So <coughs> they were trying to... Uh, so when they reduced the wages of the coal miners, there was a huge nationwide strike against this. And uh, I think the government was forced to back down. And so... Um, uh, that's, uh, that, that showed that the government, uh, the, the coal miners resisted a cut in the nominal wages. But, he says the prices went up by this, uh, they were, uh, government proposed that the, pri uh, the uh, coal wages should be cut by 10% and the laborers did not want it and they had a strike. But the prices went up uh, by 10%, there was an inflation and there was no strike. So, <coughs> the real wage is not the object of concern of the laborers. If it was the real way, then they would have reacted in the same way to the inflation. They would have said that, look, the prices of goods have gone up and our wages are no longer able to buy the same amount that we were able to buy before. So we are going on strike. Unless you raise the wages by 10%, we will not work anymore. So obviously, uh, according to economic theory, the uh, wage should be, uh, the, the, the bargain between the uh, firm and the laborer is about the real wage. It is not about the nominal wage. Because the laborer is trying to find, get a real wage which is equivalent to his marginal disunity. And this makes a lot of sense. I mean, think. Uh, you are going off to uh, Malaysia <coughs> and you have been offered a job that will give you 12,000 ringgits per month. Now, what does it mean? You won't know. I mean, should I take this job or should I not take this job? It depends on how much 12,000 ringgit can buy. The, the money, the number doesn't make any difference. And even if you convert it to rupees, you will not know because uh, the rupee conversion will tell you how much you can buy in Pakistan with it, but when you are in Malaysia, you will be able to... Uh, you know, so, how much... Will I be able to rent a house with this much money? Will I be able to buy food? Will I be able to drive a car? All of these things matter. So, it is, makes a perfect sense <coughs> what the economists are saying, that you are concerned not with the nominal wage, you are concerned with the real wage. So, uh, but Keynes said, no, the wage is not, bargain is not about real wage. So this is actually what Keynes is saying does not make sense. What the classical economist is saying does make sense. But he says that the experience of the world shows me that this is what happens. So this is how science works, that we have some intuition, we have some idea, we see the real world, the real world contradicts our intuition and idea. So, now we make, we try to understand what is, we, we put aside our intuition and we say, okay, let's try to understand what's happening in the real world. So, now you say, no, my intuition is right, the real world is wrong, and this is exactly what happens in the economist. And if my intuition says that real, uh, real wage is the thing, then you see, that's what uh, the quote of economist says, that the economists are perfectly fine if the real world contradicts their theory. They, it doesn't bother them. My theory is right, regardless of what the real world is like. So, so he says that the contention that unemployment which characterized the depression is due to refusal by labor to accept a reduction in money wage is not supported by the facts. Now, this is very important because what he is saying here is that, of course, the unemployment is observed not just by Keynes, but by the 
classical economists as well. So they also have to explain because their theory says also that there should be no unemployment. So what they say is that well the only way to explain it is that the laborers are refusing to accept the reduction. We need to reduce the wages. Uh, when the wages goes down, that's the equilibrating mechanism in the supply and demand, then the supply and demand will equal. And so why we have unemployment is because the laborers, uh, unions are strong and they're refusing to accept cuts in, real, uh, in, in nominal wages. And that's why there is unemployment. Now he says that this is not true in reality. We go and we look at the data, we go and look, uh, talk to people and uh, in a depression, everybody understands that the economy is tight people are willing to accept cuts in wages. Labor was not obstinate. <coughs> and also, uh, its productivity doesn't go down. Another, uh, yani there are many explanations that were put forth and in fact, Brian Ferguson discusses <coughs> what the classicists were saying and they had one, two, three, four, many different possible explanations which would not require throwing away the theory. Now one very important thing that you should understand is that once we go to the my understanding of models which is that models are explaining the hidden reality then we don't have access to truth anymore and that's exactly what Kant was saying. You cannot, I cannot really prove 100% that this is true. I can give you arguments that yes, my theory seems more sensible, but there is no finality, no 100% I can show you that this is the theory and this is the fact and the two are matched. Because what I have to do is impossible. So if somebody asks me, prove that God exists, it cannot be done. I can make it plausible, I can say that yes. It's likely, if you look at all of this complexity, how did it happen? Uh, the most likely explanation is that God created this universe. But I cannot prove, like yeah, I can prove that this table is solid by touching it, because that's not there. So ultimately, when we use models, that's, that's why there is no final, uh, yani Keynes had a theory, but the other people had another theory. Keynes theory cannot be proven in the sense of uh, uh, it can be made very plausible, it can be made very sensible, but it cannot be proven. That's that's why you can keep on making the same mistake over and over again, because ultimately there's the, the hidden reality is hidden. It cannot be seen <coughs> in the data. <coughs> All right, so uh, he makes many arguments which show, which make it plausible that the wage laborers are not uh, setting wage equal to marginal disutility of labor. One of these was this one, but there are many others. They are willing to accept lower revenue. But the fundamental objection, the second that he makes, so there are two objections he makes to classical theory. The second objection which is fundamental and that is the difficult one to understand and that is what is explained in my model is that the bargain between, so now I have to explain why do I bargain with the firm on the nominal wage, you have to pay me 1000 rupees, I will not accept 900 rupees, I should be bargaining over the real wage. <coughs> if the firm says that look, uh, prices of goods have gone down, so you should accept a cut in the wages. So uh, that's what the real wage bargain is about. But uh, Keynes said no, the bargain is about nominal wages. It is not about real wages. And why? The fundamental objection is because he says that together you and me cannot determine the real wage. The real wage is a property which emerges as the consequence of the working of the system. <clears throat> so it's not something you and I can decide. And this is exactly the idea of complexity which was not understood by economists then 
and it is not understood by Lucas today. That is why he is uh, considered a madman by uh, Solo. But Solo also doesn't understand complexity. In fact, most uh, economists don't understand. Complexity is understood uh, as the meaning is called the fallacy of composition. That if you, uh, if something, any, if you and I are deciding about nominal wage, the effect of all of our collective decisions will not be the same as what happens by just multiplying one transaction by n. So basically, that's that's the. Um, That's the main, these are all the main ideas of Keynes. Now, to understand this, we have to go to this model that I sent you. All right. <coughs> Alright, so this model is very simple. We have agricultural economy. There is only one good, that is corn. And so one laborer can produce one good. And really by playing, uh, participating in the experiment, you get a real understanding of what it is. And understand that the experiment did not go through to its conclusion, but I hope that there was enough experience that you will be able to understand. It is one thing to read about something, it's one another thing to experience it and to understand it. So, we have a simple fixed proportion production function. This is also called the Leontief production function because Leontief introduced the idea of activity analysis. One laborer, one acre of land produces 10 units of food. Nothing, nothing complicated to understand. Now suppose that we have 10 launders and each of them has 5 acres of land. Alright, and suppose there are only 40 laborers. So there is a insufficiency of labor. Everybody, let's suppose or everybody has equal 4 laborers each. Although it doesn't, doesn't matter for the arguments that we are making if somebody has 5, somebody has 3 makes no difference. <coughs> but so it's easy to do the calculations on the assumption that everybody has the same. The same calculations come out even if somebody has few, somebody has more, which could happen. So now the first thing is the each landlord wants to hire more labor uh, because of exactly this that we just studied the marginal product of labor is greater than the wage <coughs> uh, but there are no more laborers available <laughs> the problem is that what is true for the individual firm is not true at the economy level at the uh, at for the individual landlord, he can hire somebody away from another laborer. He can say, okay, he is paying 100, I will give you 200. <coughs> Come to me. So he can get an extra laborer. But the marginal product to that person of the laborer will be 10, but to the economy as a whole, there will be no additional marginal product from this transfer because uh, his gain is the loss of the other. So the economy as a whole has marginal product of labor is different from the marginal product of labor at the firm level. So this simple idea that you take the production function of the firm and you multi and if there are n you multiply it by n and you get the production function for the economy this is not true because the laborer which is available to me is not a laborer which is available to the firm as a whole. <coughs> and this is the basic complexity phenomena, which is also the fallacy of composition, which is missed by the standard analysis. So now, 
let us see how this economy works because um, uh, we are going to consider this in uh, this is very important that and this uh, Keynes write explicitly I think in chapter 2 that the wage must be paid first <coughs> and then the production process takes place and at the end the produce comes up so at the time that we are uh, negotiating about wages I haven't hired the laborers after I uh, after this negotiation is finished then we will know how many laborers there are and what they are working for and then the production decisions will take place so this is a very important point about endogeneity and exogeneity which is not understood by economists at all and I have uh, lots of explanations of this in the lectures but this is a complicated point because but basically uh, this is something that you need to understand that uh, an exogenous variable is determined outside the system everybody says that but they don't understand what it means so it's something that is given so for the moment just to simplify life let us take the wage nominal wage as a given let's suppose that it is determined the law says that when you hire a worker you must pay him 100 so there the minimum wage law is in effect you must pay him 100 rupees so that way we make this variable exogenous this is also a part of a modeling strategy this is very important to understand because economists don't understand it in a modeling strategy you try to make things you put try to make things exogenous to the extent possible that okay let's put this out of the system we don't have to study how wages are formed and let's see if the phenomena that we are trying to explain comes out and if it doesn't then we will have to study how wages are formed because so all right so the more things we make exogenous the less we have to worry about and the simpler our model is <clears throat> so we make wage exogenous nominal wage is exogenous so I know that I have to hire at a hundred now as uh, one person uh, suppose I have the description of this whole economy here this full information and there's so now uh, can I tell uh, how uh, so I know that this laborer is going to produce corn for me 10 units but can I tell what the price of corn will be next period so, uh, you have all the information everybody we have full information and I know that everybody else is hiring four laborers well uh, generally speaking what will happen next period is not known partly because I mean, there are many many variables that I don't know so I'm hiring four laborers but I don't know how many landlords there are I don't know what they are hiring I don't know what the total quantity of corn that is produced next year will be at the end of the season and these, these are real world and that's one very important thing that we are doing in this course which is not done in any other course think when you are starting a poultry farm I was driving in Nilor yesterday and there were many poultry farms so when you buy your chicken and you start feeding them and some point later you're going to take this to the market you have no idea what the price of the chicken will be at that time because it will depend on a lot of factors are how many other people have started poultry farms at this time and when the birds are ready apparently you have to sell them I don't really know about this but so uh, you will take whatever market uh, is whatever price market is offering at that point so when I'm incurring my expenses I'm paying wages to the laborers I'm buying the feed I don't know what the price will be so how can I maximize profits ridiculous ideas for any what is strange is that any the mistakes that the economists makes are not you know very difficult mistakes not rocket science they're making baby mistakes uh, because of their uh, ridiculous ideologies so at this time I'm really any when I'm paying the wage of 100 rupees I don't know what the real wage will be because and he doesn't know what the real wage will be because uh, the price of corn will be determined tomorrow and nobody can calculate it today this is what we are saying that this is an emergent phenomena 
it will be determined you and i cannot say that the real wage will be so and so because uh, the prices of goods are not under my control actually in this model uh, we can control the real wage because there is only one good and i am producing it so i can say okay, i will pay you of the 10 corn i will pay you 3 corns as your wage and then that will be real wage but that's an artificial thing because in normal um, thing we don't have a one good word we have multiple goods and you will take money and you will buy things and the good that we are producing will not be normally something that you can eat <coughs> so this is yani this is why you have to see you have to keep models and reality separate this is something that's realistic in this model that we don't nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow so the real wage is not known to you and it's not known to me so the bargain cannot be about the real wage this is so simple but if you take any labor textbook today and there are many of them they start by saying that the bargain is in real wages and it's equal to the marginal disparity even though keynes disproved it and explained why this is wrong so why i mean it's just frustrating why people are so stupid <coughs> why not yani let's make progress we know this is wrong let's make a better theory no we insist on using the same wrong theory over and over again even though it's known to be wrong and it's proven to be wrong i have a lecture which is 70 years of economist failure to understand the labor market because keynes theory has been around at least for 70 years and for 70 years economists have not understood what keynes was saying all right so this sequencing this timing this is not part of your economics textbook and that's why we have this simple problem the what the economists saying makes a lot of sense that yes nominal wage should it should be in nominal real wage but it cannot be done it's impossible we don't know what will happen tomorrow and in this bargain we are trying to find out yani the the real the, the price of corn which is what determines the real wage is not known today so we cannot do it similarly if you are going to malaysia uh, and you are offered this job at 12000 ringgits all you can know is that okay this is the standard job which the person who is a lecturer in a malaysian university gets you don't know what you can buy you don't know whether you can rent an apartment and you don't know what your real wage will be but you know that other people are getting it so somehow it must be possible to live so you go you don't uh, you don't bother about calculating the real wage this is how the world works if this is the going wage i'll take the going wage so this is the minimum wage that is legislated i'll take the uh, wage 100 now if you tell uh, if you tell me that okay the going wage is 100 and i'll give you 90 then you will say no that's not fair even though you don't know <coughs> how much 90 will buy you will uh, object to this and this is what exactly kane says that the kane laborers say that you should not cut my wage that's not fair it's not doesn't have to do with the going down of the real wage they are looking at how much they are earning compared to how much other people are earning and that's uh, the nominal wage and they are worried about that they are concerned about that they don't want their wages to go down but it's not the real wage this is what kane said all right so now uh we are going to <coughs> in this economy what we have is all right so we hi everybody hired four laborers there are 10 everybody produced 10 units now there are, there are 400 units of corn available for sale and all of the laborers have earned wages of 100 rupees now what's going to happen well um there are many different treatments which we can use here so i take the simplest one that okay this is a very primitive economy everybody just eats food there is no other good so the landlords are also humans they have to eat food so they eat the maximum they can eat is 10 units maximum anybody can eat is 10 units so that's maximum capacity so uh, they produced 40 they will maximize their utility by eating 10 units of food and they will sell i'm considering a one period static economy why not because the real world is like that but because 
first I will understand the simplest model, then I will build upon this understanding. This idea that we use simple models to understand reality this doesn't exist in Western philosophy. So now you are all faced, if you were in the course where you were studying Romer, you would be studying differential equations by now and you would have no idea, you would not understand either the differential equation or the reality or the connection between the two. So the idea that we use models to understand reality does not exist in your conventional textbook. <clears throat> so now we have, uh, okay, so 30 units are available for sale after I have eaten my 10. Uh, so the total amount of corn available for sale is 30 times 10, 300 units. <clears throat> The total amount of money that the laborers have is 4,000. There are 40 laborers, each of them has 100. So now, because this is a one period static equilibrium, there is no savings. The only use for money is to buy corn with it. So the price of corn will be 400 divided by uh, 4,000. Is All the money is going to be spent buying corn. And basically, if you do the calculation, it comes out to 13 and one third. So the 13 and one third will be the price of one unit of corn and every laborer will be able to buy 7.5 units of corn with his 100 rupees. 7.5 times 13 and one third is 100. So the landlords eat 10 units of corn, the laborers eat seven and a half units of corn and the economy is finished. Uh, it's a one period static. It's a, this is an equilibrium situation because Everybody, any yani the uh, labor, uh, the the landlords paid four thousand rupees, and they get all of the four thousand rupees back. So what they paid initially, they get back. So everything is restored to its initial position. So if the second period, this whole economy is repeated, there is no. Now, if there was something, something, some tendency to change, the people, somebody's plans were not realized, as we will see. For example, the uh, if the labor, uh, if the landlords cannot sell all their output or the laborers cannot buy all that they want, then people will change plans. But currently, we have an equilibrium. <clears throat> now, one thing very interesting to note about this is that money is neutral. Suppose that instead of 100 rupees, we pay everybody 1000 rupees. The price of corn will be 133 rupees, 0.33 cents. And the wages, so the prices and the wages, they go up in exactly in proportion with the money. So uh, this explains uh, the neutrality of money. As we will see, this is because of the one period static nature of the economy. Many things can disturb neutrality of money. For example, we are saying that the landlords paid uh, 100 rupees. Where did they get this money? There, As long as it's in their pockets, that's fine. <coughs> but as often happens in a real economy, you have to borrow money to pay your laborers and then you will pay back your loans at the end of the period. Now things can go, uh, things can, uh, now money can have real effects. This borrowing, this debt, because especially if there is borrowing at interest, you will have serious problems because uh, suppose in fact that all of the money is borrowed. So nobody has any money. Uh, 4,000 rupees is needed by the landlord, so every one of them bo borrows 400 from the bank. And they say, okay, I'll give you 10%. At this point, you see, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, how much money you're going to earn. <clears throat> so at the end, the total liability is 4,400 and there's only 400 rupees in the economy. This is something which Karl Marx said that whenever you have interest, it guarantees default because uh, you have money contracts. These money contracts are made with interest, but there is only a fixed amount of money. So at the end of the period, somebody or the other is going to fail to pay. Now, I am making this very smooth and symmetric, but in reality, this will not be very smooth and symmetric. Like in your game, somebody will pay more, somebody will pay less. Things will be up, up, uh, roughly in this uh, neighborhood, because that's the dynamics. I mean, there's so much money, 4,000, and there's so many goods, and all of the money is going to be used to purchase the goods, but there might be any multiple prices. So, 
uh, nobody will be able to actually calculate exactly what's going to happen. Some people, some landlords might end up hiring five laborers. Some might, people might end up hiring only one laborer. So uh, some people might make profit. Some people might make losses. But overall, <coughs> the system as a whole cannot pay. And so somebody will default. Somebody will not be able to pay. So now, in this economy with borrowing, uh, they will be default. Now, to understand what will happen, we have to understand, we have to specify what happens in disequilibrium. Suppose that a landlord borrows and he is unable to pay. Now, this is a disequilibrium situation. Now, what will happen? Now, we have to... Now, this is exactly what I am saying, that you cannot understand an economy by understanding only the equilibrium. Now, in a day, what will happen? Will he be put in jail? Uh, whatever. Yani there, there, something has to be said about what will happen in equilibrium in order to understand how this economy will operate. <clears throat> so, unless you study what happens in disequilibrium, you cannot understand how the economy functions. <clears throat> okay. So in this very simple economy, we have uh, neutrality. Second thing is important is the Say's law. So, according to Say's law, uh, when something is produced, it generates its own demand. And I am just going to interpret what Say's law says. I don't agree with Say's law does not hold in this economy, even though I was trying to make it hold actually, because I wanted to show that the Say's law is based just like money neutrality holds in a very simple economy. It's, it's when things get complicated that money becomes non-neutral. So to understand the non-neutrality of money, we must understand the neutrality of money. First, why should money be neutral in the first place? Unless you understand this, then you don't understand the problem that is created by the non-neutrality. That's why we use simple models. <coughs> when the sales law, what sales law says is that when the uh, produce, when the thing is produced, everybody gets payments. So there are factor payments. So the the production uh, of uh, 400 units, I had to pay 4,000 rupees to the laborers, which they used to buy uh, 300 units of corn. So what happened to the additional 100 units? We don't have a full, we don't have sales law yet, because uh, the um, some of the units are unsold. So now what we do is we create an artificial transaction. We say, okay, let's think that uh, the landlords received, well, 13.33 was the market price. So let's just value this, the, the 10 units that you had were, were, are worth 130. You think that you had 133 and uh, that's what you received as profits. And then you use these profits to buy uh, 10 units. And now we have sales law in this form that everybody was paid, the landlords received profits, the laborers received money, everybody used their money to buy the corn. So exactly the amount of money that was paid out to the factors was used to purchase and there is exact equality between the amount of income generated by the production process and the amount of income that was used to purchase the output. So the supply price is equal to the demand price. This is how Keynes put it in, in his book. Now, this is the, uh, one of the reasons why this is a little bit problematic is that the uh, demand price, the, 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 the artificial um, assumption that we make that the um, landlords have 13.33 is not valid. It's not valid because the um, Landlord, this 13.33 is not the price that they can get for this corn. If they actually try to put it on the market, then the price will go down because they, have, they can only earn 4,000, which is what is available with the laborers. So if you put in an additional unit of corn, the price will go down just enough to compensate. So you cannot make more money by selling corn. <coughs> This means that the market value of the corn they have is zero because they cannot sell this corn aggregate in the aggregate. One landlord could sell and he could make 1333 but somebody else will end up not selling and so the aggregate 
revenue that the uh, the la landlords can get by selling their uh, supply of um, so of corn which they have saved for themselves is zero so if you if you evaluate it at zero then the idea of sales law doesn't work because um, you cannot use zero to buy 10 units of corn yes <coughs> this is a standard interpretation that the profit they make is the rent to the land but what I am saying is that the rent to the land has to be paid in corn it cannot be paid in rupees uh, so if you ask about the value of corn you get into a trouble because and that's a because huh, they, they, uh, uh, you should think I would like to ask you to create a model in which <coughs> there is rental and people rent for money uh, that can be your exercise for next time and then tell me what happens in this model I, I have, have to think through this I don't know how it would work uh, you can create several possible models. So create a simple model, extension of this model in which the land is rented for money rather than being owned by the landlord. And then see, uh, tell me what, what you get as a result. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so sales law, we don't, uh, I'm saying that there is some, I mean, there is some, a way to understand it, but it doesn't really work uh, currently. You cannot use you cannot do it in a two-step transaction that pay the landlords money uh, as their profit and then have them buy the corn in the open market. It would, it, it might work, it might not. I uh, have to think about uh, With rental it might work. See if you can figure it out. All right, so, yeah, I don't want to think about it now. Uh, um, actually, you see, what will happen is that there are two prices, price of land and price of labor. Now the question is, is there a force which will cause them economically to be in some, with, with one price I can just label it arbitrarily. Now it is possible, now with, with rent and with uh, uh, wage, both of them cannot be named arbitrarily. So what you should do, if you want to do this exercise, is to put some arbitrary number for wage that is also legislated and put some arbitrary number for, for rent and then do the calculation and very likely you will come up with some disequilibrium and then you will have to change the wage and rental to put them into equilibrium because <coughs> that's, what, that's how it works. So you do this exercise, inshallah, you will get some knowledge from this. All right, so now the aggregate production function is not the same as the <coughs> 10 times the production function of one landlord. The aggregate production function is very simple. <coughs> it's just 4,000. That's all that will be produced. Actually, if you hire less laborers, <coughs> then <coughs> you will get Yani. Uh, for each laborer hired up to uh, 40, you will have 10 units of corn as a, in the aggregate. So it just looks like, uh, so the aggregate production function is different from the uh, unit production function because the, for the landlord, for one um, landlord, he can hire up to five units of labor, but the uh, aggregate economy can hire up to 50 units of labor. Uh, so the land, uh, the the aggregate production function goes up to 50, goes up to 40. Well, if you want to pr production function, will go up to 50 uh, with 10 units marginal product at each stage, and then uh, it will stop. After that, there is zero marginal product. Okay, so 
the aggregated protein function doesn't look like the and it's, it's similar to but it is not the uh, look like the scaled up version it's not this uh, it's not the sum because if you look at the sum of the production functions of all of them then there is an additional constraint which is that the sum of all the labors used by all the firms is less than or equal to 40 which is imposed by the capacity constraint of the labor this constraint is not uh, does not exist at the <coughs> individual firm level and that is why the aggregate production function is different from the sum of the uh, individual production function now we come to the really interesting thing about this model which is that the wage is less than the marginal product of labor this should not be the case okay we already gave the logical argument so <coughs> The point is that in the aggregate uh, at the current wage situation, now we, whether we look at the real wage, normal wage, it's all the same, uh, you are paying um, uh, the laborers 30 units of corn, uh, all four of them, and you are earning 40 units of corn and you can hire one more laborer and it will increase your profits. If you hire one more laborer, you will get 50 units and you will, we will still be able to uh, have additional surplus of 10 if you like. <coughs> so, but in the aggregate, you cannot hire more labor. And uh, suppose what happens is that, okay, so what, what the economist says is that what will happen is that there will take place a competition because everybody, all of the 10 landlords have excess demand for labor. So they will all compete with each other. Okay, you come to me, I will pay you 120. So ultimately, if you say that um, we will allow for Walrasian recontracting, ultimately there will be one wage. And suppose that instead of 100, everybody is paying 200 at the end of the competition and it will all end up in the same place everybody will have the same four and four laborers because there is no extra laborers to be had so this competition which is taking place among the laborers is not a competition which can take place in the aggregate so again this this uh, mental block of the economist if you think at the firm level it's this different from thinking at the industry level what the firm is Firm can be a perfectly competitive firm. There are thousands of laborers and thousands of firms. And so for one firm, hiring one or more laborer or less laborers is no problem. <coughs> but at the industry level, there is no more laborers. So suppose that the, okay, they, they bid up the prices. So in the one mistake is to uh, not understand the complexity of the situation not understand that labor is not available at the industry level even though it is available at the firm level and the second mistake is to think that the nominal wage and the real wage are the same and this is also a, a something which is very easy to do you say well you know prices are fixed uh, let's think of the prices as being fixed so when I I've, I've raised the wage from 100 to 200 then the real wage has increased when the real wage has increased the worker will work harder we will get more laborers but actually the real wage doesn't change because <coughs> when my costs go up by 200 then basically the um, price goes up in exactly the same proportion now what will happen is that at 200 the laborers will have 8000 rupees uh, the product is still the same at uh, 300 which is available for sale so now instead of 13 and one third, the price will be 26 and two thirds and um, the wage and price have both doubled and the amount that uh, the real wage remains exactly the same. And this is precisely what Keynes has said written in this book that the nominal wage does not govern the real wage. The real wage is an emergent property of the system as a whole. Uh, what you and I decide will not decide the real wage and so uh, even if we uh, create double the nominal wage the real wage remains the same so again the real wage I cannot change the real wage 
Now this is determined by the system. Yes, but the wage has also gone up. The real wage is the wage divided by the price. So wage has doubled, price has doubled, real wage is the same. So <clears throat> the competition among the laborers, so even though there is a shortage of laborers, there is excess demand for labor, but the real wage cannot go down to eliminate this excess demand as, and this is exactly what uh, Keynes is saying in this chapter. So, I think let me just finish this. Yeah. So, the paradox of thrift. Suppose that, uh, this is uh, very simple, this is just a clue, it's not a real model because what would happen if we build a two model world? Basically this is uh, how, what, what the clue is, you see, in order to understand something you have to develop an intuition about it. You should be able to think about it in your mind and that is what the model is supposed to allow you to do and this is what differential equations do not allow you to do and that's why those are rotten models because and actually if somebody has a lot of mathematical intuition you can learn to look at an equation and um, understand what it is saying and if you do that then mathematical models <coughs> can be useful but that requires a lot of work <coughs> uh, and it's not useful for economics because you don't need mathematics to understand economics because the situations that we are facing within real economy don't require advanced mathematics, they demand simple mathematics, accounting mathematics, excel type mathematics which we can do. And that is what agent based models are good for and this is actually what I have, this is where I have come, this is an agent based model where we look at all of the agents in the economy, we look, we look at what they are doing and then we can understand what's happening. So to come to the paradox of threat, I am giving you the intuition now. When you build the model, things might go differently. <clears throat> but the intuition is that suppose now that the laborers decide to save. They say, that, okay, uh, next period, who knows what's going to happen. Let me instead of, I, I need only about five units of food or to survive. So let me buy only five units and I will save the money for use in next period in case I cannot find a job. So what will happen is that the total aggregate demand for um, goods will go down from 7.5 per laborer to 5 times 40, 200. So there were 300 units for sale but only demand for 200 units. So now uh, this will cause serious problems. The landlord, this is now this is disequilibrium, landlord will not be able to get back, uh, some, some, some money will be surplus. Actually, they, uh, yeah, they, they will not be able to get back all 4,000 because some of the 4,000 has been saved. Now the landlords will be in deficit and then we have to understand what happens when the landlord is operating at a loss. Uh, the, huh? Then also the laborers, uh, the, the some of the pro produce is extra, uh, the price might go down because you are trying to sell and you cannot sell. So I have said that okay, price goes down, It it actually in this situation with the assumptions I have made, price will go to zero because um, you cannot eliminate the surplus because there is only two demand for 200, so the surplus will remain regardless of the price. But to make a more realistic case, let's suppose price goes down to 10. So now what will happen in the next period, the laborers, the landlords will say that look, we produce 40 but we had to throw away 10, so let's only hire three units of labor. So now suddenly in a perfectly functional economy with equilibrium, the laborers took some precaution which is sensible and that created unemployment in the next period. Now people are only hiring three units of labor and ten laborers will remain unemployed. So their um, precaution, their, uh, their pessimism about the future led to the outcome that they were fearing. This is called a self-fulfilling prophecy. <coughs> And uh, we will also study effective demand next time and we will study some variations of this model which give us some more insight into 